Hi, this is Professor Emily Blank, and today we're going to continue our discussion of historiography. In this uh, video, we're going to go over the history of writing history. So this is sort of a historiography in itself. Now, this lecture will build on the first lecture for, by going over the history of history. And for this one, I want you to think of two concepts that really drive the way that history is written. One is epistemology. That's the theory of knowledge. I'll talk more about that. And the other idea that I want you to um, think about while you're going over this is how social and political contexts change the writing of history. So epistemology and social and uh, political contexts both change the way that history is written. Let me talk a little bit about epistemology in history writing. Now epistemology, as I said ago, a second ago, is the theory of knowledge. And a theory of knowledge means that historians think about ideas and truth and how ideas are brought forward in different ways in the path the, in, at different times. So you might think about this in terms of what facts we have and how we can interpret those facts. Now, um, a lot of this debate is going to revolve around truth and whether truth is accessible, what truth is, and, and so these are some, some ideas that we'll be talking about over the next few minutes. So in order to start, we need to wind back about 200 years. Before the 19th century, a lot of history writing, in, when it tried to explain or interpret anything, it basically went for the divine interpretation. God's hand came in and scooped up the actors and made the past be what it was going to be. So any explanation just went back to God. Once we get to the 19th century, um, empiricism emerges. Empiricism is the idea that we need to have an empirical or a tangible thing upon which to basis, base, base our ideas. So it's not about God, now we need to have proof and documents to do that. And this really starts to emerge in the early Enlightenment period, in the 16th and 17th, uh, uh, 16th and 17th centuries, but really after that, um, in the 19th century, it really becomes its own methodology. So the key player in understanding empiricism and its development as a formal methodology is uh, this man, Leopold von Ranke. In the 19th century, he really developed a methodology through which we use documents, and that documents can divulge the truth. So there is this idea that the truth exists. So remember, we're going to talk about this a few times. He sees the truth as existing, and it exists in understanding the documents and understanding the context that, that those documents live in. So we don't want to just look at the documents to find out what happened, but also understand the context in which those documents live. And if we do that, we can find out exactly what happened in the past and understand it well. A, mo a more modern empiricism emerged with the scientific revolution. There's a social and political context, right? The scientific revolution changes the way people think, both empirically and also uh, theoretically. And um, the, the main actor that I'm going to talk about is Lord uh, Godfrey Elton. Lord Elton believed that there were too, there was just too much history to understand it all. That we could understand a tiny bit of history. He basically described them as bricks. And each of us understands our own little brick of history and then we get the entire history by putting those bricks together. But I, as an individual, can't understand all of history. I can really understand and research only one time period in one small subject because there are so many documents and so many places to understand. And so, in as, a, as his life's um, work, he studied just the courts of a very specific uh, century uh, in, in England. And that's all he could try to understand in the entire history of the world. And so he, under, he had read all the documents and understood it completely. And so there's an understanding that you can understand the truth, but you can only understand a little bit of the truth because he wants to be completely thorough in reading every single document that exists. Now, as the mid 20th century emerges, the, we, 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 we develop more complex understandings of the truth. And it becomes clear that we need to understand the context in a much more sophisticated way. Because we start to understand that the documents don't exist in the past for all the histories that we want to know. And so we need to understand structures and larger contexts that will explain the past. So the historical record is incomplete. 
and therefore we need to understand more about the past in order to understand the um, to, to, in order to, to explain the past um, and so this means that um, when we look at a, a source we need to not only understand um, what the source says but we also need to know who the author is and who their audience is and when and where they're talking a classic example of this is the WPA slave narratives in the WPA slave narratives uh, elderly ex-slaves in the 1930s are telling stories about their past in slavery. So this is 70 years after the fact. These people are, are elderly, so their memory is not as strong. And um, this is in the context of Jim Crow South and in the context of the Great Depression. So there's a lot of things that are, are, are shaping the way that individual is behaving. In addition, for the most part, the interviewers were white. And so in the Jim Crow South, the, the black slave, ex-slave is going to want to tell a story that is going to make that white um, audience happy. And so those, those stories have a skew to them that sort of interpret slavery as being more positive than they might have told 10 years after slavery to their family. 10 years after the slavery to the, uh, uh, 10 years after slavery to their family, they might have had a more critical stance. Likewise, we have to really understand the context in which the person in the past lived. Not our context and not our moral or social world that we live in, but understand their social world. So a slave owner, for instance, actually lived in a context in which the Bible really supported the idea that slavery was a moral institution. Today we think moral slavery as an immoral institution, but we have to be careful not to impose our morality on the past. And so uh, Marwick and, and Skinner really tried to unpack these problems. Um, and another, and, and this, this, this new understanding of history led to Marxist history. Now, Marxist history is this idea that um, we can understand people's motivations in the past if we understand their economic needs and their economic behavior. And, um, and a good example of this is Charles Beard. Charles Beard interpreted the founding generation as being men who wrote the Constitution and fought the American Revolution in order to um, say, uh, to to further their own greed, to improve their own economic status. Um, these Marxist historians emerged during the Cold War. So again, there's a social and political context that really was shaping the way that they were writing their history. Eventually, we start to really question the idea of truth altogether. The postmodernists think that you cannot find out the truth, that it just doesn't exist. Um, they argue that um, documents really only focus on elites, so they're inadequate, and history comes out one-sided. The documents are too much for one person to understand, and um, they can't, we, we as individuals really can't break free from that social context that we live in. And our, our writing is always going to be shaped by the way we see the world in the 21st century, for instance. And so, this, this really started to be a major critique on the way that empiricism works at all and tries to totally uh, destroy empiricism. However, um, there were some people who, th there's some ways that this really shed light on the way that we understand things. Um, Thomas Kuhn wrote about the history of science and he found that scientists, these are people who really value impartiality, who seem not to be focused on social or political events, were shaped by the world in which they lived. He found that um, scientists tend to reconfirm the same knowledge that they already knew over and over and over until a major shift occurs in the social and political world or scientific world. So Albert Einstein totally changed the way scientists operate. But then everybody operated under Einstein's sort of paradigm. And so you can see here that we can't get to the truth just like scientists can't get to the truth because we're shaped by our own ideas. But postmodernism also brought three really important qualities to our past. Um, it really taught us how to study sources as an important quality, um, as an important subject. So we might study 
not study the actual everyday life of George Washington's administration because we don't really even understand what happened. We don't understand what's happening in Barack Obama's administration and it's happening right now. George Washington's is even further away. So what we can do is we can take his farewell address and we can use literary and artistic methodologies to really examine it and uncover it and find out what it's saying and what message it's trying to bring forth for the audience that it's trying to present and how it gets reused in the future and so you really focus it on it the farewell address as a document rather than George Washington and his activities in the past and as I sort of alluded to literary and artistic methodologies also become an important contribution from the postmodernists they they like the fact that both of these um, fields really focus on the author and the author's intentionality and the craft and so this becomes an important focus of postmodernist scholarship. Lastly, postmodernists really highlighted it to us the fact that history comes from multiple perspectives. That if you ask one person what has happened in the past, um, th another person would have a completely different story. And this encouraged us to diversify history. Both, um, and so a, a classic example would be is asking a slave and a slave owner what happened in, on a plantation. They would have totally different stories about that experience. Um, and so African American and women's history really blossomed with the postmodernist movement. Now, the actual writing of African American and women's history really brought in empiricist um, theories and methodologies, but it was influenced by the postmodernists, so it was a good marriage of both of those things. Um, but it's also a, a, a field of study that is greatly inspired by the historical context in which it exists. So most of women's history and most of African Americans' history has been written after the 1960s, after the Civil Rights Movement and the Women's Liberation Movement made those important part of our culture and made those two, people, two peoples central to American society. So you can see with that example of African American and women's history that the idea of truth gets complicated, but we also begin to find it in a broader sense. So in conclusion, historians have changed how they study um, history as fundamental theories of knowledge have changed. They also change how they study history based on the social and political world in which they live. Historiography writes about that change. So ask yourself, historians are seeking the truth. What do you think? Can it be found? Thank you. <laughs>